Hey there, how are you? I'm well. You know what, Suze? I meant to say this earlier when we were backstage, but happy United States American Valentine's Day, Galentine's Day, Solo Times Day. Um, I love that I'm here with you. Thank you for being here. Likewise. Yeah, thanks for joining me today. It's going to be really cool. I think it's really early in the morning for you, isn't it? It's not so early. It's like 8.30 a.m. PST. So, you know, been up for a couple hours doing some things and stuff. Um, <laughs> but also I can't sleep the night before these because I get super excited. And I have been a co-host to Matthew. And now we get to be co-hosts together without like the head host. And we're just going to take it off the tracks. Sorry, Matthew. <laughs> oh, poor Matthew. I think he's probably crying right now, but no, it's going to be really good. It's going to be really good. So uh, anyone who's watching, feel free to add your questions in the chat and uh, we'll get through as many of them as we can too. And speaking of uh, speaking of which, the questions you might be adding in the chat, you know, add any questions that you want around developer relations, like developerrelations.com. There's tons of resources through Hoopy. But what is the topic that we are talking about today, Suze? So fall in love with your DevRel career. And we're going to be focusing more on how to get into DevRel because that is a big question. It's the age-old question. There's two age-old questions in DevRel, I think, or three. One is how do you get into it? One is what is it? And the third one is how do you measure it? Like it's this big mysterious thing. So we're going to demystify how to build your career in DevRel today because that is a question that we always get asked. I am super excited and uh, I really appreciate when people can list things out in a very clear way. So the way, the fact that you articulated those three main bullet points, I was like, you know what, you're right. That is what it is. Those are the three lifelong age-old questions. Um, yeah. So shall we hop into our panelists? Let's do that. Yeah. All right. So I will kick us off. Um, our first panelist is Phil Legator, and I realize that I always ask people, well, obviously not always, because I'm not sure if I just said your name correctly. Phil Leggetter is the head of developer experience at Tigris Data. He's done it all from hands-on execution to C-suite budget justification. So everything. He's been the janitor, the president, everything in between. He takes care of um, you know, the entire house, top to bottom, all of the foundation. And he's a proponent of the triple A, triple R, P, DevRel strategy framework, which I so deeply want to know more about, which um, helps numerous developer relations teams map company level goals to team activities that bring value to a business. So welcome, Phil. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. And that was a great intro. I don't know if you caught me just doing some revision uh, before I came on. <laughs> <laughs> I've also got this one and I'm not paid for these either. Uh, no. So thank you ever so much uh, for my intro. I really appreciate it. Uh, don't let me name anything. That's the other thing that with the ARP framework, um, again, it's just, I, I once worked on this thing called quicker, which wasn't spelled in any way you'd expect. It was K W W I K A. Um, again, don't let me name anything, but <laughs> employ me, please employ me and, uh, and, and help me build your developer relations teams or developer experience teams. Um, and I've had the fortune, uh, good fortune of doing that. Um, I do already have a job, just to be clear. Uh, I've had the good fortune of doing that a few times and I've really enjoyed building teams, growing teams. But a big part of that has been starting people off in their DevRel career. So I hope there's some useful information that I can provide during the stream. I should just say, I, I work for Tigris Data and you've pronounced it correctly. Um, we're a, an open source developer data platform the simplest way of putting that is we're kind of like MongoDB Atlas, but open source. We're obviously not as big as MongoDB, uh, but uh, the, the slightly more complex way of looking at it is where we have a database product, a search product, we're open source, we have a cloud offering too. And in the future, we will offer caching, pub sub, uh, event streaming, and various things like that. So I've done my piece as someone in DevRel who also has marketing responsibilities. Well, welcome, and um, I appreciate the analogies made between something that you might know more, and then you can apply that to if you haven't heard of Tigris, but I think a lot of people have, so maybe give yourself a little more credit. Okay, here. thank you. Uh, <laughs> Suze, who is up next? Before I say who's up next, whenever I hear about the framework um, that you just described, I always say it in a pirate voice in my yeah. head. I don't know if I'm the um, only one. Oh, you've got to. There's, oh, uh, there's a video on developerrelations.com of the introduction to the art framework. And I actually attempt to say it 
all in the in in the pirate accent. So by all means, people go and have a listen and a laugh to that. Oh, it's not just me yeah. then. That's good. That's good. I thought it was just me. I read it and I was like, it's just so tempting. I'm going to do it. Um, cool. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for validating me there. Um, our next guest is Kelly Hillborn. Kelly is very senior in uh, developer relations and community. Most recently at Elastic as global director of community and developer relations. Also is a community development advisor at Chainlink Labs and has previously worked at IBM. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you for having me. I'm kind of not Ooh. quite sure where I go. I'm, I'm no longer at Elastic, so I'm kind of between jobs. Uh, but I do take a lot of uh, mentorship steps and advising anywhere I can for developers and people wanting to get into the space. Uh, so hopefully I can add a lot to the conversation. Next up is Becca Hara Weigel. She's a developer, a community builder, and a keynote speaker, and a host of virtualcoffee.io, which she started as a way to bring the developer community together for informal connections and then continued because the community finds so much value in it. I actually heard about Virtual Coffee in 2021, maybe even 20, 2021, I believe, before I met Becca. And every time I get to be around her, I honestly feel like I'm with a celebrity. Welcome. It's it's so good. It's so good to have you here. You've done so much in so many different aspects for, for building developer communities and bringing developers together and developer relations professionals together. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate that. Um, it's been it's been a really great journey. I'm the uh, baby on the DevRel <laughs> conversation here today. I've only been here a couple of years, but I'm really happy to have been doing devrel -y things for a while with virtual coffee and then moving over as the technical community builder at DeepGram. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think, I mean, Sue, is it, is, with with the amount of experience combined, right, whether or not you, it's a spectrum or a circle or like we have everything from uh, grassroots, like community, like created communities to like, you know, IBM, which is like a, you know, fast enterprise. I don't have to describe IBM. People know what it is. Um, so pretty amazing what like the journeys that all of you have been on and in the companies that you've been on them with. Um, and so glad to have you all here and let's, let's dive in. Does that sound good? Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So we are going to start off with practical or, you know, this idea here is for delivering practical advice for the next generation or current generation of folks who would like to enter into the developer relations space. And so we wanted to kick us off with a little bit of context. Um, Becca, we'll start with you. Can you describe a little bit of the path you took to DevRel? And then we'll have um, Phil and Kelly um, dive into, and then and then we'll get into like the meteor topics where we get super controversial. Um, I think I don't really have a path. I just like stumbled into it. Um, I was walking a path and unexpectedly took the wrong way. Maybe I'm not really sure, but I uh, I taught college English for ten years before doing a boot camp and moving into tech. And then I was doing some consulting work as a front end developer, but my background is in teaching. And so as I went through boot camp, I somebody on Twitter said, You should be blogging about this experience. And so I was like, Well, okay, I'll, I guess so. That makes sense. Right. And then my husband is a second career developer as well. And he was speaking at conferences. And I just thought that everybody was speaking at conferences. I just thought, like, yeah, that's what developers do because that's what I knew. So I think I actually spoke at my first conference. I was less than a month into my first job uh, as a front end developer um, freelancing. And so then when the pandemic hit, my kids were all home. I have four kids. And I lost my job as a freelancer, which I didn't really even have an interview. It was a conversation, right? And so I found myself interviewing for the first time for a new role. And that's kind of how Virtual Coffee came about because I thought, you know what? I'm not the only one that is feeling this terrible right now. I'm sure that there are other people out there that are really feeling isolated. They're feeling alone. And so we should get together because I know the worst place to be is by yourself when you're having those feelings. And so I put out there on Twitter, does anybody want to join for virtual coffee? And that's how I came up with that very original name. Um, but we started getting together and I found that, you know, there were days where I was doing double sessions because people kept wanting to join. And it was that sense of community and belonging. And so I continued to do some freelance work and still do virtual coffee 
we started adding things like podcasts and monthly challenges and events and stuff. And it just kept going. And, and at some point it was our first Hacktoberfest in 2020 where it really seemed to solidify into something new in that this wasn't just a pandemic thing. Like we all want to be part of a community at some point. It doesn't have to be during a pandemic. There are lots of reasons why people can't get together in person. And as a mom of four kids, um, that was me prior to the pandemic too. And so I just continued to build on that community and and go with with what everybody wanted and to be supported by so many amazing people and volunteers there and to really understand that, you know, this is, this is bigger than, than what I initially had thought. And then somewhere, I don't know, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, the deep Graham reached out to me and said, Hey, do you want to come build community for deep Graham? We're a speech to text API company. Um, and I said, I don't think so. <laughs> Um, but then, uh, the, Michael kept asking like, Hey, maybe we should have a conversation about this. And so I continue to think about it. And then finally, I don't know if he wore me down or if I was just ready to move into developer relations after doing a lot of dev rally things for so long. And so I've been at Deepgram building community and working with the developer relations team for about a year and a month right now. So it's, I've been kind of all over the place, but I'm, I'm really happy to have found such a great community as part of the DevRel community. Dev Rally. I love that. Uh, let's, uh, what's your Dev Rally, Dev Rally-ish, Dev Rally-ite path, um, Phil? Uh, well, it's great to hear about Michael hiring people because I, th- I think his first job in DevRel was at Vonage. Um, which was my team. So again, very, very proud and honored to, to have helped more people get into DevRel. Um, my path was, I was a software engineer. Um, I, I I think the roles I've always had were always like building SDKs, writing documentation, creating sample code. So, so I wasn't aware of it because I was straight out of uni, but I was always serving developers through enabling um, experiences for them. Not really the community. The interaction I got was through support, not really through any official forums or open source or anything like that. Um, but I was always passionate about serving developers. And then eventually, I think, I mean, there was lots of opportunities for companies I was at to do a lot more externally, um, but we never did. Um, but I encourage eventually encourage companies to start blogging about what we we're doing and sharing knowledge. Um, and then that led me to quitting my job. Uh, wanting to become a real-time web evangelist, which I just made up on the spot. I enjoyed real-time web technologies. And um, and then that led me into, you know, again, the idea there was that I liked building things, sharing what I sharing what was possible and helping others. Uh, and that took me into my first developer evangelist job at a company called Pusher. Along the way, I came across um, uh, a book, an online book, by Christian Hellman called, well, developeravangelist.com, I think it was at the time. He's, he's rewritten it to be developeradvocate.com or as a new version. So that's how I discovered it. But it was that, I think a similar desire to help educate and support developers was the, the thing that took me in the direction. It wasn't a chosen path as such. I just ended up there. It's like, um, I love that there's like a thematic thing, right? It's not that everyone stumbled, but you're on one path. And then we're like, oh, this path is quite interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll fork right. Um, but something that resonates across, I think, both yours and Becca's paths is that there's passion involved for what you're doing um, or like curiosity about moving into a space and then certainly idea about knowledge sharing. Like, what do you know that someone else doesn't know or what does someone else know that might help you? And so there's certainly a collaborative um, aspect there. Kelly, I'm wondering if the pattern holds true or if I'm making an, a, a line between two dots and calling it a pattern. The pattern might hold true. I mean, some of it. The- you know, I, some of it I could have come on by accident. Some of it was very intentional. Um, I didn't start writing any code until fairly late in my technical career. I started out, I'm not going to age myself too badly, but a long time ago, answering phones on a help desk. You know, reboot your computer, reset your password, setting permissions, and graduated into networking and um, systems administration, um, Windows and Linux. I went to work for a couple of companies that were now you would call them cloud companies, but back then they were just simple hosting companies. You rack servers, you spin them up, you lease them out as fast as possible. 
few iterations of director of IT and a lot of other roles. And then I went and joined a startup, which is, which I think that's its own podcast for all the stories that I have there. And <laughs> shortly after that, I joined a company called Softlayer uh, to build a startup program. And the idea behind that startup program was you give startups, you know, early stage companies free access to your services. And, it, and back then it was, I don't, I, I, there were only two other companies doing that. Now, of course, there, there are a lot of companies that have similar programs. And so I was really doing community development as early as probably 2009 before I even thought about any type of developer activities, or developer relations. And when we're onboarding companies onto this, what, is that, what amounts to infrastructure as a service, it's really not a developer skill. And so I'm really staying in that infrastructure side and the DevOps side more than anything else. And through the course of, of onboarding startups and working with founders and speaking in conferences and speaking in front of accelerators and helping people, it was a natural progression to start with Python and, and get into everything I could to help these developers build what they're trying to build so that they're successful on our platform so that, that I'm successful. Um, and so, yeah, almost it was like intentional kind of, but really stumbled into it at the same time. And then... You know, the, the acquisition of software by IBM happened, and then I was moved into a pure dev role. And it, it was very, very different than, than even what I was doing before. I was concentrating on developers and startups, and IBM's version was, you know, typical of IBM. It's just very, very different approach. And we were doing developer advocacy for customers or potential customers, as well as developer advocacy for any developers you find out, out in the ecosystem. And so it's, I have a very, very interesting and, and, and probably unique take on, on getting into DevRel and, and, you know, lasting as long as I have, to be honest. Well, let's dive into though. those Love takes. I, I think Sue's had some ideas around, like, what she thinks would be super helpful to, to hear and to dive into from your points of view. So, Sue's, take it away. Okay. So, um, like I said at the beginning, one of the age old questions about DevRel is how do I get into DevRel? And I think there is some sort of, you know, misconception sometimes and maybe a little bit of confusion as to how to do this or what you need, because naturally people are going to approach the most visible people to go and ask them. And the most visible people may not necessarily have had the most accessible path into DevRel because not everybody can craft that big personal brand and get into it that way. And there are hundreds of people working in DevRel that you never hear about because they're getting on with it and they are just not visible to the general populace, but they're visible to the audience that they are serving through their roles. So I kind of want to get some actionable advice out of you folks for people who want to get into DevRel and they're thinking, right, okay, in the current economic climate as well, I'm really trying to hang on to the job that I've got and I'm looking for a new job. It's really difficult. I don't necessarily have a lot of time to spend on this, but then maybe there are things that I can do in my current role that will serve me really well to moving into developer relations. So my question to you is, I'm going to come to you one by one to make it easier, is which one skill would you advise people to hone so they can get their first DevRel job? And how can they hone that skill on very sort of scant time and money resources? So maybe how can they do that in their day job and then demonstrate that to a hiring manager? I'm going to come to you, Becca, because like you say, you, you, like you describe yourself as, the, as self as the baby of the group. Um, so you have very recent experience of getting hired. So which one skill would you advise people to hone? I feel like this is maybe a cop out and you want something more specific, but I think communication is the most important skill that you can have uh, as someone on a developer relations team. And there are lots of different ways to communicate. And I think that's important to remember to communicate in ways that work for you, but also discover how other people communicate, right? Because developer relations is not about you. It's about helping and supporting other people in some way. So finding out, okay, how do you communicate? What is the best way that you receive information? What is um, the most effective way for us to communicate together? And then think about how you can support other people in the way that you best communicate, okay? So like find the ways to match up those different communication skills. And in terms of growing those skills, it can be, you know, it can be anything. You could be writing. It might just be you writing a daily journal of the things that you did, get started there. It could be writing a blog post. It could be making a TikTok. Uh, or doing a video or live streaming. But I think that, you know, it's important to focus on what 
where your skills are good, but also don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone either. So in terms of communication, I found that to be really helpful for me. It's easy to stay in like, hey, I really like writing and I like to spend all of this time just focusing on this thing and taking time. But um, finding other ways to communicate has been really valuable for me and also asking people for feedback on that too. So in terms of wanting to grow and become a better communicator, sometimes people give you feedback and that's great, but oftentimes things move really quickly or there's not opportunities for feedback. And so reaching out to people that you know and who you are comfortable with and saying, hey, would you mind providing me some feedback? I just gave this talk and I want to do better. Even if you think like this is the best thing that I've ever done, there's always room to grow. Cool. Thanks for that. And Phil, you have hired people into DevRel roles at all different levels. Oh, we've got another, we've got another baby DevRel in the background. Uh, Phil, you have hired people into all different levels in developer relations. What's your take on this? So I, th I think it, the, the skills that somebody should focus on and the, the time that obviously they should focus really depends on, I think, if they have an understanding of the role, because in developer relations, there are lots of different roles from community management, from pure technical writing through, you know, technical writing into more, uh, like, you know, blog post, more, um, like, you know, acquisition focused type content. Then there's, then there's speaking, you know, which can be live stream recording videos, which is different from doing a live stream, which is different from standing on stage and giving a presentation, which is different from giving, you know, running a workshop. So I think if you know, if you have an idea, you want to be into in develop relations, but you can be specific about, okay, those are the types of roles that I'd like to do, or these are the skills that I have, that I'd like to, to do more of, then I would probably focus on, on the skill related to whichever kind of role you're, you're looking for. So I don't think I would have gone for an evangelist type role, which was definitely, well, at a, at a startup company is very general. It was like, you know, doing everything from SDK development to docs, to blog posts, to, uh, you know, running online competitions to in-person hackathons which were definitely a big thing back in 2011. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't have chosen to be, I'm more of an introvert, so I wouldn't have chosen to go, I want to be in the community standing there in front of people. I would have gone for more of a sort of educational role. So through to maybe the blog post content, probably not live streams, you know, probably not videos. Whether that would have been good for me, I don't, as an individual, my own growth, I don't know, but I think, a, an easier path for me, a more comfortable path would have been, I'm going to focus on writing some content, which will be technical content, maybe do, do a bit of you know, library work, good readmes, uh, a bit of blogging. And then I would have focused there. And I think I would have found a way into a company through that approach. But if, if you are really excited about being out in the community, then yeah, I mean, backstage, we were talking about becoming an influencer and that is, is a path into developer relations, but it definitely isn't for everybody. But some people may be very excited about that. So may want to focus on the personal brand. And I do think back when I was hired in by Pusher in 2011, that would have been ultimately what they were looking for from their person in DevRel. Although I felt I brought a lot more value through the product side of, of my work, but they really wanted awareness. They really wanted acquisition. Yeah, yeah. Very true, very true. And I think that's a whole other round table, isn't it? All the different roles yeah. and all the different concentrations of folks in, because you can get all those different concentrations in one team. Um, some companies have more than one DevRel team that have different focuses yeah. as well. Kelly, you've recruited people into DevRel roles in different organizations. So what's your feeling on this? What's the one skill you think people should hone if they only have time to do one? Um, well, I think, I think Phil and Becca gave the best answers already. So I'm having, I'm having to think fast on my feet here to come up with something, something decent. That's not true. There's, there's a lot there. The, you know, DevRel, I, whenever anyone asks me what DevRel is, I always give the kind of canned answer of, you know, it's our job to, to lower the barrier of entry for developers to utilize and using our products. Right. And so that, to me, that always breaks down to education. And so I really want, you don't have to. I've hired advocates that have zero experience that come straight from engineering and they just have this desire to, to be an advocate. And I think that's fantastic because 
I, for me, it's easy to teach someone to to find that passion and, and you know, feels right. You you don't want to put a writer on stage and you don't want to take someone that loves being on stage and stick them behind a computer to write all day. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And that their their passionate work is not going to show through. And so to me, it's important to to figure out what they're best at and they can hone that skill. And and admittedly, being an influencer is part of that. It's not an end all. It's not a be all. It's not it, it's I don't think that's a goal. I think that's more of a byproduct for me personally. I like the idea of having a large following and people that can can kind of amplify your message and, and see what you're doing. But again, to me, that's more of a byproduct. And so I really I really aim for that that empathy and education more than anything else. If you're going to be helping people solve problems, getting started, um, implementing your products and services or whatever the case is, that requires a lot of patience and empathy and and, wanting, and a desire to help people. And so my my best advice for someone that wants to get into DevRel is start doing that. You know, most companies that have a product, even in your, you know, your company time, spend time in the support channels, spend time in Slack, spend time, you know, if, if they have a Discord or Discord, spend time in there, answer questions for people, be there, be there. And, you know, what I'm describing is advocating, advocating for that company, advocating for that product, advocating for, for yourself without trying to build a following. This is more along the lines of, I want to help people be successful with what we've got going on here. And that's an advocate. And if you can learn those skills and you have that empathy, it just shows you're in an interview and, and they say, well, what are you doing in your free time? Spend time on Discord and discuss and helping people and, and making sure that they can really utilize everything we have to offer. And it's not frustrating because I can tell you anything I want to download, run or install. If it's frustrating, I skip it and I move to the next thing. And most people that I know are, kind of, are very similar. And so if you can if you can make that journey and that path easier, you're already doing the job. And so uh, to me, that's, that's the best thing that you can learn. And it's the best thing you can showcase yourself in an interview or, or to a hiring manager to say, I'm already doing this. Now I just want to get paid for it. Yeah. You do hear a lot of people say that because developer relations is very much sort of the Swiss army knife. Isn't it? <laughs> it really is. You, you know a lot about all different things and uh, you've got a lot of skills that you bring to the party. And that's why, that's why not everybody can do it. It's, it's quite a hard job and it, it takes in a lot of different disciplines. And like Phil said earlier, depending on the concentration you're in, it might have a bit more of this and a little bit of that one, but it's always going to be a big mixture. And uh, Kelly, I'm going to come to you again with this next question. To be fair, because I don't go in the same order again, because then you'll be like, oh, everybody already said what I wanted to say. Um, I think a lot of people look at getting into DevRel and they think about coming in as a junior or coming in at an entry level. Um, but actually that's not necessarily the case, is it? Because you could have quite a long career behind you. Um, like me, I had 20 years doing other stuff and then I came into developer relations. So can you talk a little bit about, um, how, or what you would look for or the kind of thing that the kind of people that you would hire into a senior DevRel role as their first developer relations role, as opposed to coming in at the entry level. Can you talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, now I don't have the scapegoat of saying they gave the best answers. So I <laughs> have to put myself <laughs> out there. No, I mean, in that in that scenario, it, it goes back to what I was just talking about. If, if someone has the engineering background, um, and again, for, for the, there's so many roles in their role, you don't necessarily have to have an engineering background. But to be senior, that means that you can almost single-handedly answer answer almost any question that comes through, um, create, maintain, and host your own events, uh, mentor junior advocates. Like there's a bit, senior to me is a really big word that means it's got this all, like you said, a Swiss Army knife, this all encompassing, you know, persona that people have that says you're going to help, you're going to mentor, you're going to teach, you're going to do all of these things. And if someone's been in, you know, if they're, if they're senior in their career, they've done, you know, some type of teaching, they they are already creating good content, uh, they spent time as an engineer, I would have no problem moving them into a, to, a, to a senior role by any stretch. But just with the understanding that, sorry, I'm going to back up. My general philosophy about a role, if you move into a role, it takes you a year to be comfortable, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's the way that I view the world. And so if I have someone come in, even as a senior, they need that year to really just get to, to absorb everything, swallow everything, get moving. 
uh, and have a, have a solid understanding of where they sit in the world and where they're going to be in the next three to five years. Um, but you know, even, even that being said, there's, you can walk into a senior role and really perform super well. I've seen a few do it that are just still the best advocates I've ever seen. And they, they came straight from product right to me and they just exploded. They were genius. And so, yeah, there, there are those times, but it does require that you have done a few things, education, content creation, uh, a desire and ability to help others. I, I can't say the word empathy enough. It's hugely important. Um, and you know, you're there, you're, you're, you exist, you've been in on online and in, in forums and in Slack and just helping others. That's what you're known for. Yeah. Senior all day long. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also just from my personal experience as well, it's about having those business skills that you can only get from having risen up the ranks in some discipline um, that you're not necessarily going to have honed with very little experience because just because you haven't been exposed to certain situations. Um, so yeah, Phil, I'm going to come to you with the same question as well, because you've managed a number of teams and in your teams, you've had a lot of different levels of, uh, folks in your team. So, uh, what's your take on this question? Yeah. See, senior for the, in the places, I mean, we had this, and I think it's quite common, you know, like P3 was developer advocate, this at Vonage, and, and I've seen this similar at other places. P4 was senior developer advocate p5 and i always get this mixed up there was staff and principal so you, you know you could get so if you think about senior it's actually only i think there was a junior p2 but we we often hired a developer advocate p3 so it's only in the middle <laughs> the senior so often we did hire quite a few people who were already working in communities but had a senior engineer role somewhere else but they were definitely you know, as Kelly was saying, already doing the job of being an advocate for the community really that they were in and those communities were very specific technology. I mean, programming language is um, in our case. So that's what we were looking for. We we're looking for somebody that could be a conduit of communication to that community, making sure we're building the right things for them and making sure we're, um, you know, being seen positively in those communities through through often supporting that individual right and doing what that individual thinks is best for for that community so i think the skills that were that that those people maybe were missing was more of the business aspect side of things was alignment with company goals uh, making sure that um you know there was you know whatever's trending in in the python world there is a use for that within within a communications platform at Vonage, um, or if the goal at the minute is if, if like quite a lot of companies that are new, if nobody's really heard of you, then just hiring that individual and go, them going, Hey, you know, I now work for Tigris data. That's not good enough, right? They've got, you've got to go, okay, well, how do I bring value to the business and value to the community and line those things up? Um, so I think that thing, that's been the hardest part. Uh, same, same when I was at Abley as well, we had, um, some amazing developer advocates, amazingly creative, uh, amazing engineers, you know, those that, those are in like an advocacy role. If you've got someone who's a fantastic engineer, fantastically creative, and everyone's just like, wow, everything they do is brilliant, but then making sure that what they're doing aligns with your company goals. So if it's okay, we, we need to be really, you know, creating content that's going to result in signups. People aren't always driven by that. And I, <laughs> I totally get it, but the business will not exist if you don't hit your goals. So that's been the, that's been the hardest part, I think, of bringing people in that haven't done a DevRel role and, and have been community focused and have been a great engineer um, or have been a fantastic community manager somewhere else, but then haven't, in the companies I've been at anyway, been able to kind of always as easily map the company goals to the work that they do. Yeah, that is super important, especially in the current climate where everybody is hanging on for dear life. And, you know, we really have to, sometimes we have to really just full on justify what we're yeah. doing, but definitely have to make it link back to the company objectives. Yeah, I mean, and Ke Kelly said earlier around, you know, you're not really into a role for a year. Some companies may not exist in a year, right? So they've got to come in. And sometimes if you're, certainly if you're hiring a senior person, okay, we've got to be hitting some goals quite quickly because you know, I work, I now work at a um, seed stage company. We probably won't exist in two years if we don't hit our goals this year. So, 
yeah i've heard some bad stories about folks that haven't even been in a job for a year before you know companies have decided to make changes as well so if you can hit the ground running then all the better really so uh yeah i think that kind of marks out the difference doesn't it you you're not you're not gonna be given that hand holding you're gonna have to just hit the ground running and get on with it so becca i know that um you are very visible on twitter and you uh like i don't want to keep coming back to this but you said it like you are the baby of the group so you've got a very recent experience of getting into devrel from the beginning and a lot of people do approach you don't they and they say to you like becca can you tell me about this can you can you help me i really wanted to do what you're doing can you tell us about some of the assumptions or misconceptions that people come to you with and you're thinking oh hang on a minute you know maybe i need to kind of guide you because you've got this idea and it, you might be kind of leading yourself down the wrong path are, are there any common misconceptions or assumptions people come out with i think the first one is that you have to be an extrovert <laughs> like i think phil you said earlier that you're an introvert i'm an introvert most people guess that i'm not an introvert but i i think that it comes down to doing things that you feel comfortable doing and also being able to get out of your comfort zone. You don't have to be an introvert. You don't also, you don't have to do all of the things, right? That's the other thing. Like, well, you know, I'm pretty good at coding and I can write a blog post, but I can't speak in front of people and live streaming is terrifying. Like then don't, then don't live stream and don't speak or don't pursue jobs that have that as one of the primary goals. You don't have to be able to do all of the things. Find the thing that you're good at, the thing that you are interested in with DevRel, and then see if that seems like a really good path for you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it is really easy to kind of feel, not inadequate, but feel like you're never going to get there because you see these people and they seem to be like the egots of DevRel. <laughs> like, like they're this quadruple threat. And you're like, how am I going to do all this? Because like you say, folks are introverted. I'm definitely introverted. I do not, no offense to anyone here on the call, I don't really get my energy from being in big groups of people. I'm much happier just kind of like getting on with my stuff on my own. But I don't mind doing the performance piece. I don't mind doing the live streams. I don't mind doing the talks. But I very much like it to be something that I have control of. And um, I think there are jobs like that that exists out there. It's just a case of finding them. And I think folks really need to have a, maybe have a reality check and go and look at job adverts and really go and speak to more people, like a wider variety of people, and find out the reality. Because I think if you focus on the people that are famous or you know super visible or have the personal brand, you're probably not going to get a full picture of what you could get involved in. And maybe there's a missed opportunity there. So uh, yeah, Rebecca, do you want to um, kick off the next segment? I do. I actually am gonna I'm gonna lob a curveball. It's not like a fast curveball, so we're gonna all see it coming. But Phil, you touched on something that I thought was really, really, really interesting, and all three of you did. And so I think maybe to, to wrap that up a bit, right? It really sounds like you're like lean into your strengths. If your strength is speaking, then like go there. If your strength is writing, then go there. If your strength is personal brand building, then buildeth away. And, and then don't underestimate the power of what you are very good at and becoming and maintaining your like joy in doing that. Like Phil, you said the power of a good read me and like, do not est underestimate the power of a great read me. You know, that is like such um, a display of empathy when you set the context for someone else to get into your own head through like an amazing read me. It's like lean into that. Um, something else that, that came out of that I think is right is this idea of, now, maybe it's just in this context, economic context, or or probably always, right? Is like, how do you connect what you're doing um, and and to the success of the business, right? Like, how do you actually measure that? Um, and sneak peek is we actually have a DevRel roundtable coming up in April, I believe, called DevRel and Dirty Words. And it's about the linkages between DevRel and marketing and sales. And for a long time, right, it was like, okay, well, DevRel does its thing, or at least like a general idea it was like, DevRel does its thing, and then like marketing sales do their, it was like DevOps, so like you dev it, and then you throw it over, and you're like, okay, go ops it, and there doesn't need to be, and maybe in, in today's climate cannot be such a, a thick wall between those things. Like these three 
things have to handshake because they all affect the outcomes of the business. Um, and so I, I would love to hear from you all if a career path or something that we have to embrace as people that are DevRelly, is that something that people entering their career, whether they are, you know, tenured seniors coming in as new DevRel people, but, you know, senior in their space or entry level, like kind of newcomers just walking in, how might how might you advise someone to think about the relationship between DevRel and sales and marketing? Um, Kelly, we will actually no. I think we have not yet kicked off with Phil. So Phil, can we kick off with you? Uh, well, so at the minute, the, the role I'm in. One of the reasons, uh, I, I guess, a bit of a personal journey is that I am quite um, driven to. You know, achieve a certain level within an organization i'd like at some point to be on a c-suite sort of thing um at vonage i was kind of at that but it was a very kind of split org um anyway so i'm at a seed company now and i'm on the i mean we're there's not a board of directors because we're so small uh so but i'm you know one of the senior people in the team and effectively i run marketing so developer experience within developer experience is marketing i mean the devrel team the developer experience team whatever you want to call it is marketing um and i think that works at smaller organizations who are entirely developer focused so you know in uh, in this book it talks about um developer first or developer plus developer first being the end user is a developer so i think actually marketing being developer relations or developer experience at these smaller companies makes a lot of sense um, so the, I mean, the relationship is, it is that function that, that is what you're kind of, kind of doing in the developer plus or in larger organizations where you've got multiple personas you're trying to reach. They're not always, not all, always software engineers. Then, um, I mean, ultimately, you know, it's that age old conversation where will DevRel sit? And I think it, again, if the goals of what your DevRel team is doing is kind of top of the funnel awareness acquisition, then the DevRel team should sit within marketing and work with marketing and, and work. I think the best way for it to work, the best way I've seen it work is to be entirely working within that function. So goals aligned, involved in a lot of the same conversations. I mean, sometimes if it's like demand gen, paid advertising, okay, don't involve the DevRel team in that. Although you probably do want them reviewing your adverts and things like that, because you're trying to reach the people that they speak to all the time. So I think the best way for, for, for marketing and DevRel to work together is to, if their goals are aligned to be the same function sales. Um, I haven't, I'll be completely honest. I haven't seen DevRel and sales work together very well at all anywhere. I think there's a completely different mindset that a lot of sales people have that does not resonate well with people that think about education as the primary um, focus. Uh, we've seen the emails once someone signs up for a new platform, if it comes from a sales team, it's persistent. There's 10 of them. The wording is different. If it comes from people with a more of a developer relations mindset, it's about education. It's about asking questions, understanding what they're trying to do. You can get some really good salespeople that do that as well. But the majority of it is, you know, can we jump on a call? What's your use case? What volume are you talking about? So I don't have a great answer to the sales alignment, although I believe sales is, in, is fundamentally important for certain types of businesses to succeed. So I wish I had an answer for the sales side, but I don't. So I will say, I think uh, the team at Temporal does this really well in terms of, I've heard developer advocates there and sales team be like, we've actually never worked so well together uh, than, than we do here. Um, so we can dive into that later. but. And that might be something to dive into in terms of teams that are seeing success with that. Something that I kind of maybe want to, another dimension I want to add to this question um, for Kelly and Becca is maybe uh, should DevRel also be looking to work better together with sales? Or is that, are, should those two things, like as we look into career paths in the future and driving those business outcomes, marketing is certainly a really integral part of that. And should DevRel, DevRelly people also be looking for ways to collaborate and include sales or is that something where it's like it's just still not the right like uh, intersection um because i think phil's bringing up a good point right where it's like it hasn't we we haven't 
traditionally seen it be done well? And should it be something that people should be looking into doing well? Um, I see Becca nodding. So Becca, do you want to take it? Um, I, I don't know that I don't have an answer for it for sure, but I will say that this has been a question that's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, and it's a, a kind of a personal project that I am working on in terms of being able to tell the story of your company, your community and yourself. Right. And I think that storytelling is key to creating connections. And there's a company that does it really well. The company 3M um, the mo most famous for post-it notes. I don't know if that's what they're most famous for, but <laughs> that's what I like to go with. I used to have, a, actually I have a wall of post-it notes over there now. Um, but they focus on the storytelling culture, right? And it's top down. It's who they are as a company and then how they share that story with other people. And I know that their sales team is actually trained in storytelling. So it's their job to go in and to be able to tell stories to the people that they're selling to. These are the project products that we have that would really help you. And they don't do it in a sales way. They do it in a storytelling way, because when we tell stories, we connect with other people. And I think essentially we're all telling stories in different ways. Right. And so if we can figure out how to create a storytelling within a company culture, starting at the very top and moving down, then I think it's much easier to make those connections with marketing, with DevRel and with sales, because you're all telling the same story. It just might be a different path to that story. And making that connection helps you to curate that story together and figure out what's most effective for your audience member. And so thinking about it from that perspective, we have an audience, we all have an audience, what story most appeals to them, maybe is that connection that can help to unify those voices in a way that allows us to work all together. I love that. Okay, storytelling. Let's. Uh, that maybe sounds like something to lean into in terms of practical advice to to lean it to. Well, I just said to lean into, but let's lean into it twice. Um, Kelly, what do you think? Well, I'm I'm glad I'm last. I could talk about this for pretty much the whole duration of this. It's called, it's like, this is a conversation that I have all the time. Um, and it is, and, and they're both, they're, they're both right. The, the storytelling is huge. And so when, when, when someone asks me what I do or what value I bring or, or anything, depending on where they're at, heavily dictates my answer. If it's the chief marketing officer, it's, well, I'm seeding the market for the next generation of X users. Right. And so, and for sales, it's like, well, I'm educating your next customer. So if I'm doing my job properly, your job is so much easier and, and they understand it because the, the time to close a deal is faster. You have, you know, honestly, and you wanted to go controversial. We're going controversial because this is, this is one of those conversations that can get you in, well, can get me in trouble, particularly in an, in an OSS environment, like working with sales will, will get you in so much trouble. Um, but ideally you do want to work with sales. I mean, sales, sales. You don't want them selling at your meetups. You don't want them adding sales slides to your presentation. You don't want them getting into your business and crossing that line. You have like a like, like a, a community contract that do not break this contract or you are out. You cannot come to my meetups. You cannot come to my events. But that's that's kind of an ownership thing. You just heard me. My events, my meetups, my stuff. Which you have to work with sales. You have to work with marketing. It's part of the job. It's that simple. And so your goals. I have a leadership philosophy. Um, this is slightly off track, but a leader should very, very simply create and share a vision that, that the team grasps and adheres to and follows, and then creates goals that, that the team understands and are very easily achievable. So that they understand where they sit within the environment and the, in the organization and those goals ladder up whatever organization, and you can be a marketing, you can be a strategy, you can be a product, whatever the case is, your goals ladder up throughout the organization so that you don't have to have these conversations very often. And you make sure that everyone on your team understands those goals and where they sit in the organization and how their efforts benefit the entire company from the ground up to the top. And everyone has that understanding. That doesn't mean that your internal education stops because, again, you have these conversations every day. But you do have to work with sales. If someone comes, you know, if you're if you're in a large organization, not a smaller one, you're going to end up at a KubeCon or an event or somewhere where you're, your people or yourself, you're doing booth duty. You're going to handle... You're going to hand over qualified leads to sales. And so the understanding that I try to have with sales is that's not my job. Leads are not my job. It's a glorious byproduct of all the beauty we bring to the organization, but it's not my role. So I'm not going to be, that's not going to be a goal. That's not going to be a task. That's not going to be a KPI, but I will end up giving you leads and I will educate your future customers. So you don't have to try so hard. 
So if you have customers that go to a meetup, your sales process is easier. So it's on you to send them my way. If you want people to learn and adopt faster, send them the community and the DevRel route, send them to our Slack, send them to our content. We have a, you know, a lot of places, we have a whole series on getting started. You want it easier? Use our stuff, but don't sell to my group. See, ownership. Don't sell to the, to the developer relations group because all you're going to do is piss them off. And particularly in an open source environment, you're going to piss everybody off. But you still have to partner with them. That was going to be my question, actually. You know, what are the specific activities? You've talked about booth duty, but you've... It, I mean, that obviously is in person, it's standing next to each other. It's, it, but, you know, often it would be, from my perspective, oh, you know, can, can you do a, a webinar for a specific customer? Or can you come and fly over to somewhere else and give a one-off workshop for someone? I mean, are there any other specific activities that you felt that there's a lot of collaboration between between sales and DevRel, or is it normally at arm's length? Uh, most of the times it's arm's length, but it's okay to to do that. What I don't want to do is have them, them being sales, change our job. Because at that point, we're abandoning our community and our developers, and that's not okay. If they need assistance or help, that's fantastic. If they need help with a, a certain customer, send, send them to our meetup. That's fantastic. They're in, they're in, let's, I'm just going to throw something out there. They're in Berlin and they want to learn about vector search. I'm going to go to a meetup in Berlin about vector search. You send them. And in the course of our day to day, where we're still supporting our community and our users and our, and our developers, we will educate them on everything that you need, but I cannot take time away from our community and our developers because that's just horrible to, to educate a customer. That's not my job, but if we can meet in the middle, that's awesome. That's fantastic. And I will help you out all you want. There are occasions where we actually have in multiple roles gone and just trained a customer because it was in line with something we were already doing. Like, yeah, we're going to go do DevOps days, Berlin. There's, you know, there's a customer there that we're going to train. It takes an hour out of a trip that's already scheduled. That's not a problem, but it, that's a slippery slope, right? You don't want that to become the norm. And so I generally try to find a very even middle ground that says, we're already doing these activities. Come in. I'll give you a hug, like bring it, bring it in. And I'd love to have you there, but I can't, I can't abandon the community that I've got to go and do this. And so, and not only that, if you have those clear goals and that clear vision, you empower your developer advocates, honestly, to say no. And I don't like saying no. I like saying I'd love to, but we need to have a conversation or, but in, in all, you know, if you, if you take all that out of the way, you're actually empowering your people to say no, because they know their goals. That is not in line with what we're trying to do as an organization. If you want me to stop what I'm doing and work on this, that's a conversation. And so goals are so huge and it has to, it has to work for marketing and sales and, and strategy and, and everybody across the company has to understand you, where you sit, what you do and how you affect them. And it makes your job so much easier. I could have talked forever. I'm like, I'm eating up time and I apologize. I mean that, um, so Kelly, uh, internally at, at common room, a lot of times we talk about sales and we talk about it in terms of value matching being like, Hey, let's say you sell for a year, but if the value isn't matched there, then they're going to churn. And after a year, you're not going to have that customer. And then you like forward all that like time and resources into bringing on that customer customer. If the value match isn't there, then like, you're not going to have that customer. And then that's just the, the goal, right. Is to like, make sure that you are bringing on the right customer, getting the right prospects in the door that are the right, that would get the right value, understanding how to make sure that they're getting the value from what you're selling. And then that value match considering, or like assuming, right, that it remains value match and that they continue to grow with like how they're using your product and your product continues to support how they want to grow. That sounds like what you're doing as um, the developer relations side where you're like, hey, if people come into the community first, if they learn from our Slack, our Discord, our discourse, our discuss first, and they understand where they want to go with their product, and now they also understand how our product matches the value that they're looking for, then we've made your job so much easier because you're not just a salesperson, you are a value matching person, making sure that this connection is the right one for a long-term journey together. Yeah, and that, that, that also, it helps everyone, but keeps you out of the process. And I believe Common Room calls that a community qualified lead, right? Yeah. Like it's yes, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Well, Again, I don't want it to be a goal. But we've I do got want the jargon. To, I do want it to be a healthy byproduct. Um, I have one more thing I wanted to touch on there that I think the three of you sort of touched on as like, so we talk about community codes of conduct, right? It's so, it's so important to have a community code of conduct when you're going to be hosting a community. But I think the three of you touched on this idea of, an internal community code of conduct. So it's not just here's how you should act 
you know, as ex here's the expectations of our community members, but here are the expectations of us as people who serve our community members across the organization. This is a space for learning. This is a sacred space for asking questions. This is a safe space that will or will not be recorded, whatever that is. This is not a space for selling. This is only a space for understanding where your customer is at to then inform that story when you have sales conversations down the line, if there's a value match. And so I think I really wanted to highlight that because I think each of you said that in your own ways around like, it's not just about what you do externally, but how you educate people internally. And I think an internal community code of conduct is like a very powerful tool as you bring other people from the organization into those conversations with community members. It absolutely is. We actually have a um, a presentation we give to all newcomers that, that goes over the community and, and everything that we do and the rules. You can come here to learn. You can come here to immerse in the community and really get a good feel for everything. No selling. No, like there's there's this list of rules that you have to agree to, and, or you know, please don't please don't break the rules. Um. Yeah. Thank you for that, Suze. We are moving toward rapidly the finish line of the conversation. I want to know if you wanted to ask uh, our panelists for any parting words of wisdom, advice, or mistakes to avoid. Yeah, so before I do that, I just wanted to touch upon something that everybody just said, which a thought that occurred to me was that, and I've seen this in a lot of organizations, people tend to care about what they're tasked with, and they think that's what everybody's tasked with. So they think everybody needs to be working to help that same goal, which isn't necessarily the case. But the other thing I wanted to say to anyone who does want to get into developer relations um, and maybe is working in tech already <clears throat> is that I actually think that people working in technical sales, so like solutions architects or in technical marketing are really good candidates for coming into developer relations. I've seen that happen a lot where people have made that switch. Um, they have a lot of the good skills that are needed. They have a lot of um, understanding of the potential customers and the people that use the product. So if you're in that, those sorts of roles and you're thinking about getting into DevRel, then I would say you probably have quite a lot of the skills and experience that are needed, but you have to change your mindset. So you need to think about, right, what is this audience I'm going to be speaking to in developer relations because it's going to be different. The messages are going to be different and the outcomes are going to be different. But yeah, definitely consider that if you're in technical sales or marketing, um, it's definitely a route that I think is open to you. So let's go into the final uh, question then. I think, let's see, let's talk about mistakes. Let's, let's talk about things that people really need to avoid. Things from your bitter experience <laughs> that you really don't want anyone else to suffer don't worry about how bad it is let's just get it out there because you know we've all made some really bad mistakes or been led into them by somebody um let's start with you becca because you have a recent experience of uh getting into devrel but you're also talking to a lot of people who want to get into it i thought you were gonna say you have a recent <laughs> experience of making a big mistake like what what is it Suze? can you tell me <laughs> No, you've got recent experience of getting into DevRel, so I'm sure you've seen a lot of pitfalls and maybe some people trying to lead, take you by the hand and lead you into something that wasn't good. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so I, I think that I, I, last week I met with um, my former team lead, Michael, and we went over my strengths and weaknesses. And one of my weaknesses, he said, is you say yes too quickly. And it's very true. Um, I get, I hear an idea and I get very excited about that idea and I want to run with it. And a lot of that comes in the past working not on a DevRel team, right? Doing a lot of running things myself. Yeah, I can handle this totally. But that's not, uh, it may not necessarily align with what the business goals are, what the strategy is. Um, or, you know, I was a teacher, so I ran my own classroom and I did the things that I wanted to do because it made sense. Right. And so maybe the biggest mistake that I've made over the last year has been saying yes to doing all of the things. Right. And then at the end of last year, feeling like I just wanted to lay down and die for two weeks because I was so exhausted. Um, but I also need to take that step back and create that space to say, like, before I say yes, 
I need to think about how does this align with the goals of the business? How does this align with the strategy and the story that I want to tell for community? And how does this look three months down the road? Does this make sense? Or is this just me being really excited about like this thing that might be really impactful right now or that a bunch of people might jump on board with and not recognizing that there's a lot of other things that need to come into consideration before saying yes? Yeah, that is that is good advice for anybody in any job, I think. Think before you say yes, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, saying yes to everything is just totally infeasible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but it's hard, though. Sometimes you get pressure. And I think sometimes when your manager says you say yes to everything, it's like, well, boss, that's because you asked me to do it. What am I supposed to do? Sit there and say no, really? I don't know. It's, yeah, I think that's a whole other thing, isn't it? Like, let's do a talk on how to say no to your boss. It is a yeah. tendency too, I think, like being early career at something, you want to say yes to the things, right? Because you think that you should be doing all of the things or you need to pr prove that you can do 500 things. Don't, but it, I think it's Gant Laborde who said, who emphasized to me prior to this, like when you say yes to everything, you're saying no to other things as well. And so kind of like flipping that mindset becomes really important. What is this? Yes. What does this mean that you're saying no to? And that might be your own free time, time to recover or to really deepen your skill set in one particular area. Yeah. And it's hard when you, like we said about the quadruple threats earlier, when you're seeing all these people doing all the things, it's really hard to, to kind of remind yourself that you don't need to be doing the same. So Kelly, you said that you are uh, Currently in between jobs, you're evaluating your options. What mistakes are you going to avoid on this journey that you're on now? There's, there are a lot of them. Uh, luckily, I haven't made any that are earth shattering in quite some time. Um, you know, I, 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 I can see a lot of people saying yes very quickly. I've, I've, I've taken that a different route and saying, I don't want people to just hear no from me. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned that earlier where it's, where I don't want to say no, but I also not going to agree to their to the demands of someone else if it you know adversely impacts what I'm doing. As far as um, mistakes to make or not to make, I, I find that the bigger the, the mistakes that that tend to cause me problems are the ones where I didn't have all the information. Um, so there's two things that I want to impart to people. Number one is if you're going to join Devrel, I, I would like everyone to just have a have, you know have a a promise to themselves to be genuine um, and be sincere. If you offer to help someone, don't make a hollow offer, help them. If you say, hey, reach out to me if you need anything, that literally means reach out to me if you need anything, you know, and, and you, are, you are promising to help them through it and keep that. Word will travel very quickly of you being a helpful and, and genuine person. As far as mistakes go, try to have all the information before you make a decision. I, I, another philosophy I have is, you know, I, if I go into an organization, I don't do anything for about 90 days. All I do is learn. I listen. I talk to everybody. Um, and I don't make any changes or, or anything earth shattering for about 90 days, just so I can really understand everything and not, not what's going on. Why is it going on? If that's not really clear, okay, why was the decision made to go that route in the first place? So I really understand what's going to happen when I, you know, amplify it or shut it down or whatever the case is. And so most of the mistakes that I've made in, in I don't know, in the last 10 years or so are generally, I didn't have all the information. And so I made a mistake and I was like, oh, well, I didn't know that. And you're like, and then in behind the back of my head, well, then you shouldn't have made the mistake, dummy. You shouldn't have made the decision. Don't do that. So really try and have all of the, all of the information that you can possibly have before making a decision. Even if that's about career, if you're starting a new role, make sure you love the technology and you love the people and you love the company and make sure you have everything you can possibly have to make the best decision. Yeah, that is definitely a, something you can learn from when you've made that mistake. Frequently. at least once and um whenever you look back you always know that you made the decision based on the information you had at the time but once you've made that mistake you know that you have to gather more and where you might be able to get it from so yeah that is definitely good advice and phil lastly phil yeah i mean i'll continue that and and kind of put it on on the two sides i think there's a big thing certainly with people that have been in devrel for quite a while uh that are interviewing for new roles that they kind of want to have a few conversations and then the decision be made. And I get that some people have the experience and have the online collateral to justify that um, they know what they're doing. But the thing is, part of it is to 
actually have a moment of working with that company you're potentially going to join to learn from them, to understand what that working environment is going to be like before you make that decision of taking a job, which should be a big step, right? It should be a big thing and it should be a commitment. So, so take the time to genuinely understand each other and to work with each other. So that's the individual that's hired, but also I've been very, uh, I've made mistakes in the past in terms, sometimes they've been great decisions. Other times they've not been good decisions, but I get very excited in the interview process. If, if it's clicking with someone and I'm in the position of authority and I can go, right, I'm going to make you an offer now. Now that's just not good. And I've done that a few times, but I've been so excited about the people that I've been speaking to that I'm like, okay, let's just start working together so in on both sides of it you've got to really understand what the relationship's going to be like what the job's going to be like whether you can do the job or you can really you know as an advocate anyway you've got to love the product you've got to be genuine about that so that all having all the information is definitely you know take your time with that interview process on both sides of it whether you're the hirer or the person that's um whether you're the the employee or the or the employer potential employer or employer and then the last tip is for more junior people getting into DevRel, that you may not have all the skills required to be successful in that role yet, but you're being hired as a junior person for a reason. You have potential that that you can do this role given time. But from your perspective, you need to make sure that the company that you're joining can give you that support that you need. Don't join it like so. For instance, I mentioned earlier. You know, we've only got a certain amount amount of runway as a as a uh, as a seed stage organization, we need to everyone to come in and hit the ground running. We can't hire junior people at the minute. I would love to be able to hire junior people, but if I'm spending half of my time helping someone succeed in their role, I can't perform as an individual contributor for half of that time. So as the person that's being hired, you've got to go, okay, what stage is this company at? What's the expectation from me? Am I going to get the support I need to be successful here? Or am I going to join and within two months understand that, okay, I'm making a few mistakes that's completely expected as someone in my stage in my career, but their responsibility as the employer is actually to support me and they're not giving that. So make sure as the person being hired there in the junior role, that you're joining a company that has that structure to support you in the role that you're joining for. Yeah, definitely. And what you just said reminded me of something else. You see a lot of job adverts for, you know, you're going to be the first DevRel person where you're going to be setting up the team. Just be really careful about that. Unless you're super experienced and you have done that before, it could be it could be really, really, really challenging and quite horrible because you may not ever get that promised team. The, the, what you think DevRel should be for that company may not be the reason why they've hired you. There might be a big disconnect. And because you're the only person, you don't have anyone behind you to kind of, to help you fight your corner. So it can be quite a lonely place. So. Yeah, if you see anything that's, you know, you're going to be the sole DevRel, just treat it with a bit of caution. It's not necessarily bad, but definitely do your due diligence there and make sure it's the right fit for you. All cool. Info. Rebecca. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, like Kelly said, make sure you have more information, more information than you think you're going to need. So, yeah, Rebecca, shall we? Shall we wrap up? Yeah, all I can say is, Thank you all for not only being here to discuss DevRel, devrel things for an hour, but over an hour, and for diving into things that felt comfortable, uncomfortable, and everything in between. Um, it's such a treat to have you all. And Suze, thanks for being, a, thanks for letting us co-co-host. What a fun thing. Happy Valentine's yeah. Day from the United States. <laughs> Happy Love. Valentine's Day, everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Hope for all the... Uh, the viewers enjoyed it and it gave you a bit of food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks, Bye.